teaches us. If we could get just a little bit of this chapter in our lives, we would learn how to live, what it means to live in Christ. You see, it's one thing to live, right? It's another thing to have a life. <clears throat> Everybody saved and unsaved, they they exist. <laughs> right? You listen to me, young people? Listen to me. I'm gonna share something with you today. I'm talking about the true vine, life secrets, life secrets. Often when I go to a door, I'll ask the person that I'm with, that I'm speaking to, I'll say can I share with you the greatest truth I've ever known? And I guess, you know. And I share with them John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I got gripped. Uh, I got gripped. Stricken. With... <clears throat> Romans 5.8 this week. I've been giving out Romans 5.8 for decades, right? But it gripped me, Brother Bob. God commendeth. He showed, he proved his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, God doesn't just love us as saints. He loves us as sinners. That's why he sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. Amen. That's why we can go out there and tell them, God loves you. He loves you so much he sent his son to die on the cross for your sins. He commendeth. It's a good word. Proved. Showed. Guaranteed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then when we get saved... We find out how much God really loves us. Amen? <clears throat> All right? Pretty quiet in here. I said, when we get saved, then we find out how much God really loves us. Amen? <clears throat> All right. Day to day. One of our members, matter of fact, a couple of you, blessed me this week. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Somebody sent me a message and said, how can we use our feet to go and be a blessing to others? That person knows who they are. Another person was going through a checkout and was such a good testimony that the person behind paid their bill. Amen? God blesses us. But how about when we're going through the valleys and we don't understand, well, why is this happening to me? Right? In John chapter 13, we see the Lord Jesus and his disciples in the Last Supper, right? Uh, Judas is found out, right? So he runs off. And then it goes into chapter 14. Okay. Hey, let me give you a, a great verse on uh, eternal security, eternal life. Can I do that? John chapter 13, the last verse of John chapter 13. Are you there? You with me? John 13, 38. Let's read it together. John 13, 38. Here's Peter. And he said, well, I'm going to, uh, don't, I'm never going to deny you. I'm going to follow you to the end. I'm going to jail. I'll go to death for you. What did he say? Verse 38, everybody. Jesus answered him, wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. <laughs> Boy, that's a real upper, huh, for, for Peter. <laughs> Thanks for the encouragement, Jesus, right? Jesus was just giving him the truth. You know, I think we, you know, Bob, there's a song. You and I ought to sing it before you can't sing it. Pour with me. And it's a convicting song. It's, the title of the song is Good Intentions. <laughs> right, Bob? Oh, yeah. Good Intentions are not... Yesterday, we're knocking on door. I'm 
Several people. Fernando. Okay. Yeah, I'll come. I'm coming. You know. Okay, I'm not going to hold my breath, but you know, a lot of people make promises. They have good intentions. But as the song goes, good intentions are not enough. <laughs> you got to work and pray. You got to put your put effort in. Well, Peter had good intention. Here's what I want you to see. What's the very next verse? After verse 38. Somebody read the next verse. Marine, you got it. Marine got a new Bible. He's got a new Schofield Bible. Amen. Why don't you read that next verse? What's the next verse after 38? He's going to read it. Go ahead. Just read the next verse in your Bible. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. John 14, verse 1 is the next verse, right? Let's all read it together, shall we? Sorry, buddy, and I didn't put, mean to put you on the spot. Everyone, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Everyone, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Everyone, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. <clears throat> okay? Did you ever stop to think what verse those wonderful words came after? <laughs> well, right, right, right. Let's go back. Chapter 13, 38. What did he say? To Peter. Oh, you're going to lay down your life for me? Uh, the, cock's not gonna, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. What's the next verse he gives Peter? <laughs> Again, what is it? Let not your heart be troubled. Amen. You believe in God, believe also in me. You, you know what? Uh, <laughs> praise God for the. The King James old girl, King James Bible. The chapter and verse divisions came a little later. You know that, right? Okay. This was all written as one gospel, right? And so I'm saying chapter, verse 38 and 14.1 are connected. He's saying, okay, you're going to fall, Peter. You're going to get weak. You're going to deny me three times. I want to tell you something, Peter. Let not your heart be troubled. Amen? You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's... Peter, you still got you still got a home in heaven. Amen? <laughs> You're still my child. I'm coming back for you. Okay? And that's what chapter 14 is all about. He, he, he gives these promises. He gives these promises that, that, first of all, I'm God. Amen? You believe in God. What? Believe also in me. We believe in the deity of Christ. That's why I'm not sitting in a kingdom hall this morning. Amen. Okay. Whatever they do in there. I don't know what they do in there. I, I often thought maybe I'll go and visit one time, right? We got this Mormon building next to our house, right? I thought I should go over there sometime. No, I don't want to. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll stay away from it. All right. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told that. Go. So he's gone to prepare a place for us. We need to live in those verses these days. Live in the promise that Jesus is coming back for us. All, you know, Brother uh, uh, Matt, you said this morning, <clears throat> talking about in this, this, this incredible world we live in. <clears throat> you know, wow. Wow. Leaning on the everlasting arms we need. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I'll tell you what. My Lord Jesus has come back for me. This world is disintegrating. We get it. It's falling apart. Not necessarily falling in part. It's falling in place. Everything's falling in place. Mm -hmm. Right? So when you think, well, the world's falling apart. No, it's really falling in place for the Antichrist to come on the scene. <clears throat> and then everybody's going to say, how oh, wonderful. We have this articulate, eloquent, intelligent man. He's far greater than AI. <clears throat> right? Mm. This guy's going to have so much talent. He's going to have so much charisma. And the world's just going to fall down and say, 
How wonderful that we have this leader finally. Look, he's going to, look, he made a, a covenant with Israel. Isn't that wonderful? Right? <laughs> well, it doesn't last. <laughs> right? And it ain't going to last till Jesus comes and rules with a rod of iron. Amen. All right. So the Antichrist is going to be very articulate. So if you're not saved and you're left behind, just letting you know what's happening. And so he gives this, this, this comfort to them in chapter 14. And he says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. And then, uh, then the last verse of chapter 14, I'm laying the groundwork. We're going we're gonna to come back to this next week, but I'm laying the groundwork now. Okay, and what's the last verse of chapter 14? <clears throat> Anybody? Well, let's read it together. Come on, ready? The last verse of verse 14, verse 31, uh, verse 14, chapter 14, verse 31. All right, phone's off, please. But, everyone, but that the world may know that I love the Father, as the Father gave me a commandment, even so I do. And then what does he say? Arise, let us go hence. Many years ago, Bruce Wilkinson wrote this little book. He wrote the uh, Prayer of Jabez. But he wrote this one that most people have no idea about. Secrets of the Vine. <clears throat> Took me a while to dig it out of my mountain of books. But he gives a great description as we enter into this chapter of 15. This is what he says. Eleven dejected men followed Jesus down the stairs and out into the cool night. Some of the disciples carry lamps or burning torches to light the way. Perhaps Jesus tells them where he is heading, to a garden on the Mount of Olives where they often spent time. Perhaps they already know, but I believe that their footsteps echo as their footsteps echo through the streets, not a word is spoken. The disciples follow Jesus down the hill through the winding streets of Jerusalem. If you've ever been there, you'll, you'll know about that. Avoiding the Temple Mount and its noisy celebrating crowds, Jesus turns right and leads them out of the city. As they turn sharply left to follow the Kidron Valley up toward their destination. Along the terrace, terraces that follow the curve of the valley, they pass through the ancient vineyards. They walk in single file between rows of neatly tended grapes, plants that have been bearing fruit for generations. To the left above them tower the city walls and the ramparts of the temple. Ahead and to the right rises the Mount of Olives where Gethsemane and betrayal await. So basically, here... Uh, as we come to chapter 15, they're actually making their way toward Gethsemane. Okay, got that? All right. Jesus reaches for a grape branch, showing the signs of new spring growth. Its woody stem lies across his precious hand in the golden light. Now he begins. Let's read verse 1 together. Everyone, I am the true vine. And my father is the husband. Again, I am the true vine, and my father is the husband. Aren't you thankful that Jesus is the true vine Amen. this morning? <clears throat> and so, Christ is going to have a final, vital meeting with his disciples before. He gets to Gethsemane, and before the betrayal at that point, you know, everything moves really fast, right? Okay. The Garden of Gethsemane, he cries out to his father, has that incredible prayer, John chapter 17, right? We all know about it. And so Christ is going to have this last vital meeting with his disciples before Gethsemane, before the trial, before the cross, before the resurrection. What's he going to say to them? What's important before they get into that flurry of activity where he won't be able to talk to them anymore, right? What is his last, final, important message to them? 
What will he say? What will he teach? Chapter 13, the Last Supper. Chapter 14, let not your hearts be troubled. I'm coming again for you next. This is what he speaks to them about. The secret of life. Amen? Not just the secret of life. Lots of blithering idiots think they have the secret of life. Party on! Drugs and sex and rock and roll. Satan has all kinds of flashing lights for you, shiny objects. All right, I was explaining to Marine on the way to church today. You know what? I have to say, I'm glad we don't have some big cathedral. Because then people's eyes would be on a building. Amen? Now, it ought to look nice. It ought to look decent. The folks from Mesa this morning said, well, you should have a sign coming. I'll <laughs> showing. So we'll work on that. All right. We'll see what God has. The issue isn't the building. It's the message. We're not an entertainment center. We're not even an information center. We're a soul winning station. A few yards from hell. And we're thankful to be here. We open God's precious word each week. You got six opportunities a week. How many, how many of those do you take every week? One, two, three. You got six opportunities. Some of you take all six of them. And your life, I think, is doing pretty good. All right? Take as much as you can. Amen? All right. So here he says, okay, he gets, he gathers the disciples around him, and he says, what's he going to say? I can hear the disciples kind of jostling. Let's get close. And let's hear what he's going to say. I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman, the vine dresser, the head farmer. <laughs> Verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. The secret of life is Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Without Christ, there is no life. Got it? It's simple. Without Christ, there is no life. <clears throat> Indulgence says, drink your way out, or drug your way out. Right? Philosophy says, think your way out. The keys to life are in the passages of your brain and mind. Think your way out. Science says, invent your way out. Right? Industry says, work your way out. Have a work ethic. Nobody's going to give you, yeah, work your way. Labor says, strike your way out. Militarism says, fight your way out. Education says, study your way out. Jesus says, I am the way out. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the true vine. Now listen to me. There's lots of false vines out there. Got it? Lots of false vines. Not far from where we're sitting. <laughs> you can go down to the, a block down to the por biggest porn shop, Southern Arizona. You can go across the street to the gay bar. <laughs> Quote Gable. Not much gay about it whatsoever. I'm here to tell you, 54 years ago, I came to a saving knowledge of Christ. And all these years, I've learned about how wonderful he is. Wonderful a Savior. How wonderful it is to know this true vine. Because I was hanging on and clinging to a 
to false vines for 16 years. <laughs> I found the true vine. I'm thrilled. He is a path if any misled be, be misled. He is a robe if any naked be. He is a chance if any chance to hunger. He is bread. If any be a bondman, he is free. If any be but weak, how strong is he? A, to dead men, life is he. To sick men, health. To blind men, sight. And to the needy, wealth. A pleasure without loss, a treasure without stealth. Christ is the true vine. Now, this isn't the first time he said something like that. He said, I am the true light, <clears throat> which lighteth every man that comes into the world. We believe in universal enlightenment. Did you know that? We believe that every person born into this world, God gives them light to come to him. That's what it says in John 1, 9, right? Which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Right? <clears throat> I'm thankful for that light. Because I didn't have a whole lot of light. But the little bit of light I had, I followed. Our house, in Orinda, California, we didn't go to church. I have time for that. We didn't have time for church. We're busy working. We're busy building things, building houses and, and, and making some money. But I had a little bit of light. And I had a terrible time in my life. And you know what my mother said to me? And she was as lost as Granny Goose. I mean, she, <laughs> she says, well, your grandfather goes to church down there in Oakland. Why don't you go to church with him? Okay. I went to church with him. Yeah. He made me the best pancakes to this day. He made the best pancakes I ever had in my life. Put a little bit of cornmeal in it. Anybody ever, anybody do that? See, nobody does that. My grandpa did. Louisiana coffee, right? Louisiana coffee. A little bit of Cane's sorghum in the syrup. It was the most amazing meal I've ever had. <clears throat> Breakfast. And then we went to church. Foothill Boulevard Baptist Church, Oakland, California. And I heard the gospel for the first time in my life. It was a long journey, folks. I went forward, made a false profession of faith. And then he came after me, Dr. Winnegar. I want you to go to camp. I don't go to camp. I'm too busy having fun. I don't go to camp with no sissy Christians. He came after me. Fraser, I want you to go to camp. No. I'll, I'll pay your way. Well, no, maybe. Okay, I think I'll go. Any girls up there? <clears throat> you know? All right, I'll go. <clears throat> he got in the car. He said, you're riding up with me. <clears throat> so we got in the car. We went to the airport. We picked up this. The, the, the most incredible thing happened in my life at San Francisco Airport. <laughs> 1969. A man got off the plane, <clears throat> and he had a cowboy hat. <laughs> he came out, and he had this walk, you know. <laughs> Praise the Lord, Doc. 19 souls saved yesterday. Yelling aloud like that in the airport. Everybody's looking at him. 19 souls saved. Praise the Lord. Dr. Don Camp. I fell in love with him right there. He was laughing and joking all the way down the corridor. And I said, whatever he's got, I got. if i got to swim to China, if I've got to become a mass murderer, whatever he's got, I want to have what he's got. <clears throat> and I got saved that week. <laughs> I never looked back. I got the true vine, the Lord Jesus. My father's the husband. The true light, true bread, the way, the truth, and life. Receive him. If you're not sure. And we got this Halloween season. Season of death. We live in a town that has an obsession with death. I don't know why. And they, well, what do you think of when you think of Tucson? You got this, you know, you got this, 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 this. 
skeleton head. <laughs> I got a few people want to go down to that march of death, whatever that thing is. I'm just going to talk about life. Jesus is life. Amen. <clears throat> Light up for Jesus. Listen, man, I'm not the only death I'm, I'm worried about. I die daily in Christ. <clears throat> my, my old flesh and my old desires, I die daily. I'm crucified with Christ. <clears throat> Keep it going, Bob. Okay. <clears throat> That's not you? Okay. My father's the husband. Let me tell you something. He expects fruit. Did you know that? He expects fruit. He desires and he demands fruit in our life. So when we reach, when we, we share Christ with someone, we go through the plan of salvation carefully, we don't know if they're saved until we see a little fruit in their life, right? <clears throat> we're looking for fruit. See, we're not judges, folks. We're not judges. But we are fruit inspectors. Amen. So we look for the fruit in somebody's life. and Hey, man, is there anything there? Is there a desire? Is there a hunger for the word of God? Is there a a desire to be with God's people? Is there a love? Is there an assurance of that salvation? Do they talk about Jesus? Is there some fruit? Is there something flowing out of the heart of their life? To indicate they're saved. Not just saved from hell. Saved from sin. You know, my life would be pretty boring if all I had was a, you know, a ticket ticket to heaven <clears throat> and there's so much more to Christian life than just having a fire escape <laughs> amen all right so number two once you see the secret of life is Jesus Christ if you don't know him and let me tell you something Christ is our life in Colossians 3 and verse 4 he said when Christ is our life okay <clears throat> whatever the question he's the answer Whatever the problem, he's the solution. Whatever the hurt, he's the healer. Whatever the bondage, he's the liberator. Whatever the burden, he's the overcomer. Whatever the need, he is the supplier. And whatever the sin is, he's the forgiver. Amen? That's our Savior, the true vine. And he says the secret of bearing fruit is purging or pruning. Next. So he expects fruit. Luke chapter 13. Noah read it this morning, right? Now, <clears throat> we've had a discovery lately. I hold in my hand. <clears throat> what is that? An apple. Not just any apple. <clears throat> this apple's out of this world. It's called a cosmic apple. <laughs> okay? How many know about cosmic apples? I know one man does. <laughs> it's yours. Really? He introduced me, yeah. He introduced me to cosmic apples. Okay. Now, many, many years ago, Noah, I went into our house. Dad had built a house, 1260 Campus Drive. You can look it up. 1260 Campus Drive, Berkeley, California. And then he, right next to it, he bought the lot next to it. He built... Uh, a beautiful two-story house. And then next to it, he built a three-story house. Beautiful three-story house. 1270 Campus Drive. Well, <clears throat> I was excited because we had a new house. We moved in. And my mother had put this bowl of fruit out on the table. <clears throat> I came bouncing in from school. And I thought, man, that's great. And I picked that apple up. I picked that thing up really fast, man. I said, man, I'm starving. Pick that apple up. <laughs> Plastic fruit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if my mom did that just to, for a joke or what. A practical joke. but I mean, it was so real looking. <clears throat> you know? Kind of like these fake lawns, right? Whoa, they keep a good lawn. Yeah, you get down there. 
It's turf, you know. Fake. Lots of fakes out there. Listen, there's lots of fake fruit, too. We need to be discerning. The one gift I pray you all have is discernment. God is looking for fruit in our life. Anything that would bring him glory. Now there's inward fruit and there's outward fruit. Mm -hmm. Got it? The inward fruit is what? Uh, buh, buh, buh. Right here. Gave a reminder right there in the bulletin. Fruit of the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. God desires to live and infuse your life with his Spirit. And when he does, the outward beauty and holiness and righteousness of that is the fruit of the Spirit. Do you have a heart of love for the lost? Do you have a heart of love for the saints? You know, I'm thankful that the Lord didn't say, <clears throat> you have to like that person. <laughs> Amen? You get what I'm saying? There's a lot of people I love but I don't necessarily like, I don't want to hang with them all day long, you know, go on vacation with them, right? But God's commanded us to love. Amen? Mm -mm. Love your enemies. How about that? What? I can't do that. You're right. You can't do that. <laughs> God wants to do it through you. Pray that prayer. Lord, I can't love this person. Love them. But you, I'm asking you to love them through me. And so the Lord wants that fruit in your life, that inward fruit. He also wants the outward fruit. Good works. Amen. Good works. And the fruit of what? Souls. Proverbs 11.30, the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. All through the scriptures, it speaks to us about fruit. Right back into the Garden of Eden, the Lord says to Adam and Eve, uh, uh, of the fruit of the garden you may eat. Oh, these, 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 all of this beautiful, luscious, teeming fruit. There's one over here. You can't eat that one. That's my tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat that. In the day that you eat that, you're going to surely die. You and I were there in that garden. In Adam. In Eve. Say, well, if I was there, I wouldn't have ate that fruit. <clears throat> you would have done just what they did. Now, there's a lot of discussion about what that fruit is. The problem isn't the apple in the tree, but the pear on the ground, right? <laughs> okay. Some think it's pomegranates because that's what they wore on the grapes. Edge. Grapes, yes. Grapes, right? When <clears throat> Moses told the, the spies to go out, spy out the land and and bring back fruit. They brought back, listen to me closer now, they brought back a cluster of grapes, a cluster so heavy and so big and luscious, it took two men to carry it. Right? And you know what that showed? Composite unity. Okay, and I'm getting, are you with me? Composite unity. What does that mean? That the Lord himself is three in what? One. And that was one cluster of grapes, numerous grapes. Shows composite unity. They also brought <laughs> pomegranates. They also brought figs. But they said, oh, the giants of Anak are there. And they 
the Amalekites and the Jebusites and the electric lights and all the lights. <coughs> we can't. Thank God for Caleb, who stood up and said, we're well able to take it. Joshua. And Joshua led them into that promised land. God wants fruit in your life. He wants fruit in my life. What does God need to prune out of my life to produce more fruit? That's what I want to ask before we go today. Let's bow our heads and hearts for a moment. What does God want to prune out of your life and my life? And oh, I've got an illustration I'll share it tonight. What's God want to prune out of your life so that you'll bear more fruit for him, for his glory? Now, I know our lives are jammed, most of us. We got so much going on. I cannot believe it's October 1st. I missed several events that, that just flew right by me. Wow, where did that month go? September was a good month, but it was also a tough month. But I want to make sure that I'm bearing fruit. Thank God for any souls that were saved in the month of September. Thank the Lord for any fruit. I want you to personally go to the Lord and say, Lord, <clears throat> I want you to do some open heart surgery and search me out. See if there be any wicked way in me. See if there's, see if I've got, you know, like Hebrews 12 says, any weights, any baggage you need to drop. That which you're grasping, you need to let go. What are you grasping? What are you holding on to? What rattlesnake are you holding on in your life that keeps biting you? You need to just throw it down. Let it go. Somebody in your life that's a negative influence. You, you, look, let the Holy Spirit speak to you. I just want you to bear fruit and rejoice in the fruit that God bears through your life as you yield to him. And we haven't even gotten to abiding in Christ yet. That's a whole... So we, could, we could preach on just abiding in Christ for a year and really not get started on it. So I'm going to give you the high points, and I want you to study, and I want you to delve into this matter of intimacy with Christ and let the life of Christ flow into you and through you to others. Do you know what it means to abide in Christ? We're going to talk about that. Before we get to that, God wants to do some pruning in your life. He wants to cut away that which is in the way. Will you let him do that? I wonder how many would say, Pastor, pray for me. I need God to do some purging, some pruning in my life so that I can be a flourishing. You know, it says in Psalm 92, it says, that we're going to dwell in the house of the Lord and we're going to bear fruit in our old age. Amen. I think of Brother Matt and Edie here this morning. They live that verse. God's still bearing th fruit through them. What an example for us. Brother Bert, Brother Frank was right. What an example you are for us. Brother Bob, what an example you are for us. I just kind of tag along and get to be a part of their lives. What a joy. I want Christ's life to flow in me and through me. He's the vine. We're just little branches off that vine. Amen, the true vine. Let the, 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 vine, let, let the branch of your life bud with Holy Spirit fruit. And your life will impact others 
and others will come to Christ by your testimony and by your mouth, by your confession. These are not days to be waffling. This is, these are days to be bold. Amen? Let's go out and claim some ground for Jesus Christ. I know the devil thinks he owns this area. You know what? My Bible said Jesus told us that the harvest is, is white already to harvest. There's souls out there that want, want to be saved. Some of you are here because you are the last door. Father, speak to all of us. Speak to me. Thank you for being the true vine. Father, thank you for being the husbandman. Prune. Prune our lives. Make us productive in Christ. May you flourish through us. May your life shine forth through our life and our countenance. And may a multitude of souls be saved in these last moments. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's